Aum Gyatra Jnana Gyeya Bheda Pare Natmani Vidyate Chidanandaika Rupa Tvaddipate Svayameva Tat Gyatra Knower Jnana Knowledge Gyeya the object of knowledge, bhedaha, these differences, are in the supreme, na, not, atmani, in the self, vidyate, is, chit ananda eka rupatvad, because of being a single form of the nature of knowledge and bliss, dipyate, shines, Svayam, by itself, eva, alone, tat, verily. There are no distinctions such as the knower, knowledge, and the object of knowledge in the Supreme Self. On account of its being a single form of the nature of endless bliss, it has no such distinctions within itself. It shines by itself alone. Namaste. Well, it's early in the morning, my favorite time of day. Everything is silent and peaceful. So as the sun moves toward the horizon, even before it rises, it lights up the sky. And in the same way, the self, when it approaches the horizon of our being, our awareness, lights up the soul, the self, the consciousness, the mind, the body, the, even the world, that light greater than the sun, in its pre-dawn effulgence, lights up everything. And so even before actual uh, complete enlightenment occurs, there is this pre-dawn wonderful moment. It's called the golden hour in photography. One hour plus or minus sunrise and sunset. So in that time, you have like the ideal conditions for any kind of spiritual work. And so we do all our research. I mean, not all, but a lot of our research, especially on the verses being produced at the moment during these hours. And it really shows up in the results. <laughs> I'm so happy. So there are no distinctions such as the knower, knowledge, and the object in the Supreme Self. So can there be consciousness? No way. Because consciousness, as we have been discussing for many years, is the triple, the ontological triple of the knower, the known, and the act of knowing or the knowledge. Knowledge in the Upanishads is equivalent to consciousness because you always have a subject, an object, and the act of knowing. Also the instrument of knowing. The instrument of knowledge can be consciousness or it can be a book or other medium that transmits a message. And when the message is about Brahman, that's when we sit up and take notice, because that's where the final knowledge is. That knowledge, once known, that leads to the end of knowing. There can only be knowing, there can only be knowledge or consciousness where there is duality. But within Brahman, there is no duality. There are no distinctions. There are no parts because there are no boundaries. You know, just like we look at a human body and I have hands, fingers, arms, legs, and so on. 
different, different sensory organs for different stimuli. So in the same way, every body is a collection of parts. Everybody that is in the manifested world. <laughs> but Brahman is not in the manifested world. Therefore, it has no parts. It has no boundaries. It has no organs, no sense organs, especially, no mind, no thoughts, no speech, no action, no time or dimension. Because all of these things depend on duality. And without duality, they simply can't exist. And they don't exist. But because Brahman is just this single undivided form of bliss, we use the word form in the sense of quality. Because in Brahman, there is no form for the same reason as there is no qualities, no actions, etc., no consciousness. Because it's one, undivided, unbounded, unlimited self. So because of this, because it's tangible or experienced, lived experienced aspect, is bliss. Therefore, one who is aware of Brahman is automatically blissful. Now, what is this bliss? We just got a very interesting comment from Kiwi Mike, who says, Like so many words that point to the ineffable, Bliss is popularized into being a symbol for a feeling akin to exhilarating joy, a feeling of supreme happiness. In other words, as an emotion, which it cannot be as emotions invariably come and go. Bhante Punnaji defined it as cognitive satisfaction. So he at least unlinked the term from extremely emotional into a more measured concept of the mind that had more to do with alignment with the all. My experience is more akin to Shankaracharya's linking bliss to infinity. And if I was pressed for synonyms, I would include words like serenity, embrace, and alignment with infinity but I would struggle to constrain those words into a definition. So I would concur that bliss can only truly arise for one who has become realized, for only then is it known that it is Brahman alone that experiences bliss as the creator and of his creation being experienced. So for Brahman, the process of creation is his path of self-realization. Because not having consciousness in himself or of himself, of the seer cannot be the seen. So he has to do a trick. He has to create another seer and seen. So that he can see himself in his reflection. I know this is deep. This is way deep. This is the Mariana Trench deep. <laughs> but it is the ultimate reason behind the creation. We say that Brahman shines. But what does it shine with? What is its light? It's not ordinary light, for sure, but it is self-awareness. That awareness of one's being that reveals oneself and in doing so reveals the world. Because Brahman is by nature aware of everything, 
that is its quality. I mean, if, if you can even call that a quality. <laughs> it's just a fact of its being. So when Brahman creates the world, it creates an artificial duality because there really is no duality, but it creates the illusion of a duality, just as the inversion layers in the atmosphere above the sand in the desert create a layer of refraction that looks like water, but it's not water. It's a mirage. In the same way, the world is a mirage created by Brahman so it can view itself in the reflection. Now, of course, the reflection of the material, because it is created, because it is ultimately false, is going to be distorted. Just like the reflection in any mirror. Huh? Even if the mirror is perfectly flat, it's still reversed left to right. And in the same way, the reflection of the world, of maya, reverses the direction or the flow of cause and effect. Causality actually travels backwards in time, while effect travels forwards in time, and they meet at the end state the already existing, already created, intended end state of the illusion, which is to merge back into the reality. <laughs> so it's going to happen. You know, it's like, okay, have fun, play around with the manifestation while it exists, because it's not going to be here forever. It's going to last approximately, I don't know, 600 billion years or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> there are different interpretations. But the creation eventually results in the annihilation, the Mahapralaya. And at the end of every day of Brahma, there is another Pralaya up to the heavenly planets. Only the higher planets, Brahmaloka and above, are preserved. Everything else goes back into the causal ocean until the morning of Brahma, the next day of Brahma. So this is the world we live in, apparently. Huh? But the world of Brahman, is beyond this. This is what we have to realize. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya.